Welcome to the I Am The Cavalry track, Hungry Hungry Hackers. We were delighted to welcome and invite Sick Codes, and due to reasons, travel and otherwise, Mr. Codes was not able to join us today. However, we do have Mr. Casey J. Ellis uh, to, to be present and help us walk through some of the issues related to challenges in security in our food uh, ecosystem. Casey is the chairperson, founder, and chief technology officer of Bug Crowd, as well as co-founder of the Disclose.io project. Casey has been in the business for over 20 years, has done amazing things, and we look forward to learning more about what is going on here. This will take about 20 seconds to light up. So. But it will light up. I'm sure it will. <laughs> All right. Casey, who is not sick, tell us where we're going to go in our next 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, has anyone seen the We Are All Sick Co's meme um, or the sub meme on, on the Twitters? And if you haven't, it's all good. Um, so basically, uh, you know, I think the idea is that um, when we learned that uh, Sick was going to have some trouble uh, getting into the country, Josh and I decided over a couple of beers at a cabana yesterday that um, you know all tall redheaded Australians are basically the same if they work in this industry. <laughs> and it's it's actually not just that. Um, when Sick did his first presentation at DEF CON last year and, and actually started presenting security research, um, it's the first time his, his face had actually been on the internet and people thought he was me. Um, so we ended up swapping out. It just turned into this whole fun little meme. Um, and, uh, you know, the interesting part and, and why I thought, you know what, I could actually probably have a go at just running through this content and, and, and getting it out there um, is because I was actually involved in a bunch of the stuff that, um, that he's going to talk through uh, in my capacity as, you know, bug crowd disclose, like all of all of those sorts of things. So I am sick codes for the purpose of this presentation. Um, <laughs> What gets really funny, so yeah, if, if this is like, you know, hopefully that uh, explains any jankiness in, in how this all kind of plays out. But it's a cool story. And like to me what it is, um, obviously the, the title is, is um, food specific, right? But to me what this is, is, is really a story of how security research like fundamentally changed the perception of safety criticality in an in industry, um, which is something that's very near and dear to my heart. So. We good to go? Is everyone confused sufficiently at this point in time? I know I am. Yeah. All right, let's rock and roll. And let's honestly, let's have some fun with this because it's going to be a bit strange, but I'll get through it and, and you guys can ask questions. The other thing as well is that um, Paul Roberts gets a shout out. There's actually a panel following this and that's going to be more of a conversation around kind of my, my personal opinions when it comes to this stuff. So this is partly representing, you know, Sick and, and his point of view on things. So all of those, and now I'll get into his disclaimers, right? <laughs> Told you it'd be fun. Um, this is independent research, all security vulnerabilities reported to vendors. Nothing represents employer, partner, association, neither past nor present, other than description in the presentation, nor does it represent necessarily Casey. Um, that's a good call out. Um, slides of CCO, etc. All right. So basically, you know, SICK is a pr like a pretty prolific and, and fairly recent uh, security researcher. And in terms of you know when he popped onto the scene, I actually met him for the first time when he doxed me through Odesk um, in, in 2020. That's a fun story that we can tell some other time. Um, but since then, he's actually had a pretty prolific vulnerability disclosure and security research career. And a lot of his work has actually, you know, become, it's, I don't think that these things are complete in terms of their impact, but what it did was it precipitated and catalyzed a bunch of changes in thinking. Um, and that's kind of what we're gonna go into here. And this is where you can find me slash him. It should be some sort of drinking game for whenever I get that confused, right? Is that? <laughs> no. But really, yeah, as I said, this talk is, is about you know, how security research can actually change, um, cause change, and, and his views on that, right? So the birth of, of his security research, the birth of my, all right, is it his or my? What do you reckon? Vote. Both. Both? All right. <laughs> you guys are tracking. It's all good. I'm, I'm twisting myself in knots up here, but you guys are fine. So the birth of the idea um, for getting into agricultural research was actually Paul um, uh, seeing, I think, a comment that, that Paul made, uh, does John Deere have any CVEs? Not sure what precipitated that exactly, and I'm sure we can get into that later, but that was the, the origin of it. So 
Paul is um, very much focused on the right to repair angle of, of, of all of this stuff. I think what happened in, in Six Mind at that point in time was the idea that like right to repair is actually inherently less friendly from a security standpoint. And if you add, if you combine that with a safety critical or a nation, like a national security um, critical industry, you've got a real problem at that point, potentially. So SIG goes off and does some security research, finds a vulnerability where basically if you submitted a VIN um, from a free developer account, you could get back all of the customer details in the response. And I believe that this was enumerable. So you could basically go through and, and get all those those details. So, you know, in the hands of um, a cyber criminal or a nation that wanted to understand the mechanics of another country's food supply, that's pretty handy, right? Um, I'm not quite sure what the slide was for. Uh, why companies need to be ready to receive, yeah. So so really what he's talking about there is the fact that like, this is a thing that happens. You know, I, I think we're at a point now where vulnerable disclosure and bug bounty, it's being talked about a lot, a lot of people are adopting it. Obviously, you know, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but this is really one of the reasons why um, that needs to be in place as a, as a standard thing, because this, this happens. Like humans write code, humans make mistakes, bad things happen. Hopefully you find someone who's actually friendly like sick that can you know, pick it up and disclose it and try to take it through. But as a, as a vendor, um, you just kind of need to expect this stuff, right? So, yep, off he went and, uh, and, and told the story, it got picked up and it went from there. Um, John Deere's response was, was basically not quite in line with, uh, with, with six kind of perception of um, the actual technical problem. Uh, and by the way, this research, um, he goes into some other stuff, which I'll get to in a sec, but this is research is the, in the closing keynote of DEF CON last year. I highly recommend it on the technical side if you're into that type of thing. Um, but they basically said, we immediately investigated and, and fixed things, um, you know, nothing enabled access to customer accounts, et cetera. So, you know, who's, who's a hacker in the room here? What's the first thing you do when, it, when a vendor says that? <laughs> like, nah, bet you missed something. And they did. Um, so basically what happened, he did some additional research to be able to get, you know, details in a different way. Um, I believe he continued to kind of pivot and there's, you know, all those stories are out there online as well. Um, so, okay, cool. Um, this is actually, yeah, the point of this is that some of the information that he was able to get out in his subsequent research was a lot more sensitive from like a PII and a, a, and a user standpoint. So basically John Deere responded to this by saying, no, we meant sensitive data. Um, so that was kind of part of their fix, right? And again, this is his opinions. I'm just trying to render them as, anyway, <laughs> this is fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is not, I mean, it was, speaking as myself, this is not an uncommon initial interaction. If you've got a vendor that goes from never having experienced this to experiencing it for the first time, they freak out and do stuff like this. It's not uncommon. Um, it's all the road to doing it better, ultimately. Uh, but yeah, John Deere established a private bug bounty with no bounty and no disclosure. Um, Sick found this very confusing. Uh, and yeah, he, he reached out to me. Um, we'd already been talking on some other stuff, uh, but we talked about the general mechanics of, of you know, bounty incentives, phone disclosure, like what does it look like as an organization? Like what I was just saying before, it's like, this is actually, it's not ideal, but it's also not uncommon. Um, so what's the path from not doing this at all to doing it well? And what are the bumps in that path? So we had a good chat about it. And, and basically, you know, I, I kind of laid out some of the different things that from a, a pure security researcher standpoint can seem quite unreasonable and seem quite counterproductive to, to the outcome that you think is the right thing. Um, but when you think about it through the lens of <clears throat> the recipient and the and the journey they have to go through, like the you know, five stages of vulnerability, grief, like all of these different things that happen, they're pretty common and, and it's all about the next step, right? So that was the, uh, the um, this is where I get to introduce myself as me. Literally got these slides 24 hours ago too, by the way, so we're jamming on, who says what? Yeah, whatever, y'all get it. <clears throat> so this was one of the things I said, um, basically, like it, like the idea that like, Full disclosure is not an ideal outcome, right? I actually um, did a speed debate in favor of full disclosure at, a, at an MBT con one time and won 
because to me full disclosure is like you know people don't like it but it's kind of like not liking death and taxes like it's the default failure state if you're a security security researcher who doesn't feel like they can get um people to pay attention to what you're doing right so yeah, if there's messing around, then there's a higher likelihood that you're going to find out. So what does Sick do? He goes off and, and does additional security research on, on John Deere. Um, and this is the tractor hack stuff that uh, that popped out. This is, yeah, that's what I was referring to before. Like as an IoT uh, exploitation primer, this is a fantastic video. He's super funny uh, to, to watch as well. Um, and, uh, you know, he kind of gets the point across. but. Kind of went through this whole process of trying to figure out how to jailbreak a head unit. Um, keep in mind that this is a, a product that's meant to be a SaaS offering, um, which is where the whole right to repair thing comes into it. But he was looking at it through the security lens, right? Um, found a whole bunch of stuff, watched that talk, because I'll butcher it if I try to resell it. And that was the outcome. This is where everyone claps. <laughs> yay, sitting on the thing, yay. <laughs> And this was actually, like I said, it was a hoot seeing this um, presented, but like this was him going deeper to make a bigger point. Like what he was trying to do was to get the vendor to understand that like, no, this is, you, you guys don't seem to get the risk that's associated with what I'm finding, um, which is always a perilous thing because security researchers don't necessarily have the context of the organization, but sometimes they're just not getting it and you have to do stuff like this. Um, this is at, uh, at DEF CON. So really, this is what he was trying to get across through through the story arc. Like, should more bugs be dropped? Should more things be disclosed? Is that the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? I obviously have a lot of opinions on this one, um, but from his his perspective, you know, does it devalue the bug and and make it less likely to be used by cyber criminals trying to do their thing stealthily, for example, because all of a sudden it's public knowledge and you've got IOCs, you can defend different things like that. You're actually devaluing the utility of the bug at that point. On the flip side, is it newsworthy? Is it actually going to highlight um, <clears throat> the fact that like bad cyber things happen to a particular domain um, like it did in this case, right? Um, the other thing I would say about SICK is that his, his um, sense of telling a story and actually getting people to understand like really complicated technical stuff is phenomenal. And he actually used that to, to kind of get the message out. Um, you know, is there an NDA? Is there a VDP? What the fuck are we doing here? Like all that, all those things come into it. Um, but ultimately, like this as a question that is good to ask yourself, I think is, is, is very, very valid. And a lot of what he was trying to think through all the time. So <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure what he was trying. No. <laughs> I think the point of this slide really was the idea that um, the financial because bugs are, bugs are worth something, right? If, if you've got a vulnerability, you can do bad things with it, you can sell it to a third party, you can sell it through a bug bounty program, you can use it for clout and drop it on the internet. Um, they all have, in terms of you know thinking about like putting food on the table, uh, a different kind of return, and that's just the nature of a bug. Um, I think what he's saying here is that's not a linear thing. It's gonna be an exercise for the reader and, and really depend on what's actually happening at the time. Um, and of course, this one, which I think is a little bit more clear, uh, the, the idea that like if you're thinking about as a security researcher that's focusing on, on public safety impact, which is, you know, the whole theme of the cavalry track, the bigger the bug gets, the more, you know, I, I, you know chutzpah, I, I, whatever you want to say that's not balls in, in this case, because he can pull that off and I can't. Um, it takes more nerve uh, to, to get that stuff out there because the consequences increase with the amount of impact that you're having, right? So there is that dynamic to it as well. So coming back to you know where I started with this, like the way that I'm, my bias and how I'm telling this story is really to encourage people to think about the security research as being able to have this type of impact, right? Um, these are some of the things that you need to factor in. As examples, um, going back to Paul's original question, are there any CVEs on underwater sea vessels? This is, I debated removing the slide because it's like, um, but he's not wrong. Yeah, if, if there was transparency and the, if there was proper, you know, the proper ability to call out some of the safety issues that existed in that system, would the things that happened have happened in the same way? Maybe not. Any CVEs on high Mars rockets? Um, you, you think about the ability for, you know, the kind of, 
malicious actors or adversarial actors that are looking for the same information, that's a good one to answer. Um, so he's kind of trying to paint that picture there. Like ultimately, like, is dropping O'Day and roasting companies helpful, right? <laughs> Ever. Um, again, back to my opinion, I think it's not ideal and it happens as an option of last resort. Is it helpful? It was here. Um, does it mean it's always helpful? No, I, I don't think it's a thing that you need to do necessarily all the time, but thinking about it through this lens, it's not just a default bad thing, right? Um, <clears throat> all good? Closer to the mic. It's the Australian accent. And the fact that I've just come off a flight from Thailand, right? <laughs> he lives in Thailand. I don't know. Um, so this is actually a, a, a issue. This was actually the first time we, he and I, worked on a on a submission or a disclosure together, um, and it got pretty interesting pretty quickly. Um, basically, he was doing research on TCL televisions. Uh, they have a Android subsystem. Um, he went ferreting through that and found a bunch of stuff that's like, that's weird, that's obviously vulnerable, but it actually looks like it was put there on purpose. Um, what should I do with this case? He reached out to me. Um, and you know, I immediately got a little bit nervous about the whole thing because it's like, okay, this is, this is actually going to have some impact. And sure enough, it did. Um, basically, it was determined, uh, we got it into the right hands. It was determined that it was a deliberately inserted backdoor. In, in TCL. Um, and the thing about this television is it's, it's everywhere. If you look for that brand, um, it's right across, you know, in all sorts of sensitive places in healthcare, inside government, airports, like it's all over the shop, right? This is 2020 before some of the changes happened that made that less of a thing. Um, but, you know, this actually, I think, potentially helped precipitate some of those changes. Yeah, and you know, ultimately what we did, um, aside from you know trying to work out any kind of safety concerns that he might have with, with this kind of information was to get it into the hands of the right people, um, make sure that it was taken care of properly on, on that end. And it ended up escalating from DOD originally into DHS. And uh, there was a you know, very concerted response to that. Thank you. I feel like I'm leaning right in on this thing, but it's all good. We good so far? Yeah, all right. We are all sit coats. Six hours on. So yeah, what what happens when you push a bug's news beyond its limits? Because like literally, when this stuff dropped, um, <clears throat> basically we we got the information, put it all together. It went off into the high side and disappeared for a period, and then this stuff started coming out of DHS, and we realised it was the same thing. Um, and what you know, Sick wanted to do, um, this was independent uh, as a decision of his, but he basically wanted to push <coughs> this news further. Same same idea. It's like how do we how do we tell this story and make sure that the impact of this is is known because this has consequences, um, and it's probably not the only code of its nature that's out there in the wild, right? Um, one of the this is when we had the safety conversation. Um, there was a. Uh, pretty dramatic stock hit um, as, a, as a result of this. Um, and yeah, basically the DHS were, were incredibly um, responsive to this particular piece of intelligence um, and actually used it as a way to tell the story of you know, the potential risk of foreign consumer equipment um, and just the fact that it's possible. So it's not necessarily targeting you know, China or a particular country. It's like, this is just a thing that we need to be aware of. Um, in this case, you know, obviously they're, they're calling China out, but that was a big part of the uh, the broader narrative as well. So, yeah, pretty much, um, you know, he found a bug in CCP owned stuff. Um, Homeland Security takes it and runs with TCL as a suspected backdoor. Um, what he's calling out here is like, what if that same type of security research had gone into some of the things that were ultimately exploited to create this outcome, right? Interesting thought. Same thing with JBS. So we're talking about food. This is the, this is the uh, you know the the food happy hack hackers kind of um, theme. But um, you know personally, I see this as a safety critical critical research issue. And these kind of impacts, these kind of consequences, these kind of questions apply to how you focus your research if you're wanting to have this kind of mark, right? Grain co-op. You know, there's a lot of stuff in here, and we're actually going to go into this more on the next panel. So. I'll skip for a bit. Um, yeah, so ultimately the result of, of uh, some of the research um, that he did on 
John Deere um, and the conversations that happened off the back of that actually created and spawned really a task force of um, you know around around uh, agricultural connectivity um, I think it actually got classed as a critical infrastructure domain at the, at the same time so you know this sort of precipitated that um, were there people already thinking about that type of thing probably um, was this a massive catalyst to it actually happening yes 100 percent um, and you know what was observed at that point in time is that th those tasks those um, task forces, had a lot of attention. Uh, you know, the, the combination of the narrative that was around some of the stuff that he'd done and the fact that there is growing interest in this particular area, it drew attention to the right things. Now he's going back to the colonial stuff. Like I said, 24 hours ago, but. So you see the impact. Okay, so what he's talking about here is how an incident actually creates the same effect. Like if you're talking about security research, that's a friendly person, you know, ultimately in terms of their intent. Maybe as a recipient, you're not comfortable talking to them yet, but they don't have the goal of tanking a pipeline or doing anything like that. The other version of that is when this happens. So, so colonial pipeline does its thing. Um, all of a sudden, you know, everyone's pulled into that cost them five million from from a, a, a I hate it when people call extortion payments bounties but bounty <laughs> um, paid um, and you know ultimately that that precipitated a lot of activity around critical infrastructure itself and ransomware as well um, JBS foods similar sort of thing um, 11 million paid out there yep um, trade secrets stolen in agco Yeah, so this is tying into the fact that, you know, this is like we, this is the whole I am the cavalry tie-in. Um, and it's honestly a big part of the bug crowd story as well and what we do with Disclosure. Like there's not enough talent that's directly accessible for organizations to proactively get ahead of these problems. Like we are going to be a catch-all um, in a lot of ways. And that's ultimately an opportunity that we've got. And, to some extent, I actually think it's a responsibility that we have as well. This is an example of it actually working and causing change. Um, so John Deere's response to this eventually was to spin up and get very proactive on, on, on the security side. Um, they did a bunch of stuff, you know, was it the right things, wrong things, won't go into that. I know he has opinions on that one, but they responded um, and they spun up, you know, their own uh, teams. Um, they created challenges, so they actually moved, like they went full 360 from trying to like just push the thing into the dark to actually encouraging events, encouraging people to come in and do this type of work. Um, they spun up a program on a platform that I've never heard of. <laughs> hey, <laughs> no offense, it's, I mean, this is awesome. Like, I don't care, honestly, who, I do care from the entrepreneur hat on, um, who people work with. But it's more important that, that they just do it. It's actually one of the reasons why Disclosure exists. It's like, you know what? You don't need to be a bug crowd customer to do this. You just need to do it. So that's actually a good thing. And shout out to Hackeroni. Uh, <clears throat> uh, all right. So this is really kind of the, the sum of this very interesting talk. Um, I did consider as a drum kit back there, I, I, I figured flipping the switch and saying this is going to be like a Led Zeppelin concert, I'm just going to solo for 45 minutes, but hopefully this has been use, useful in, in terms of some of the stuff that we've gone through. You know, asking yourself as researchers in the room, and it, even you know, folks that are adjacent, folks that are in policy, it's not just hardware or web vulnerability research that's actually factoring into the stuff now, like data is becoming more of a thing. Um, you know, as, as everyone starts to turn their attention towards AI and ML, that's becoming a thing. Um, there's all of these different technical domains where regardless of what you do on that side, you've actually got the ability to focus your efforts towards these kind of outcomes. And, you know, do it the way he did it, do it your own way, it doesn't really matter. Think about the kind of outp uh, output that you can have um, in terms of, you know, making things safer, not just more secure. Um, so that's the question, you know, how do I use research to make positive and meaningful change in the world. We are all sick codes. Thank you.
we should not let six replacement off so easily as this. <laughs> that was easy. What? So now is your opportunity to stump the champion. If you have a, a specific question regarding this matter, uh, response, uh, coordinated vulnerability, etc., this is your opportunity to talk to a rock star. So if you raise your hand, I will run this mic over to you and then you can ask your thoughtful question. Or I'll play the drums and be an actual rock star, either way. All right, you have to be on the drums to answer this. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, so I'm curious your opinion on this. Obviously, the juicier the target, the bigger of an entity they are. Let's say you're a security researcher and you find a problem. Yep. You kind of have to take a deep breath and ask yourself, okay, am I going to open this can of worms by disclosing it? And yep. then there's the whole pros and cons between private disclosure versus public disclosure, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but I feel like by nature of public disclosure, they're going to receive that information in the tone that they want to receive that in, be it confront confrontational and I, I think more likely confrontational than friendly. So if by default it's seen as an escalating action more often than not, what would your thoughts be on the right way to communicate that stuff? Just so that you have the best chance possible at it being received in a way that doesn't in involve, you know, federal authorities knocking on your door, which is a real concern, at least in the United States, yep. even to this day, even with advancements made in the public disclosure place. Yeah, for sure. I do think on that last part, it's less of a concern now with, you know, the DOJ charging rule changes. Um, with CFIA and, and, and frankly, a lot of the work that a lot of people in this room have done to make hacking safer for people that are operating in good faith. But yeah, it's still a risk, right? Um, and you know, probably the better example there is the the version of um, of that that happened. You know, Sick wasn't in the U.S. when he found that TCL bug, so there was like an actual door getting kicked down um, risk factor associated with that disclosure. So. You know, can't really fix that one. Going back to your question, I think private is always the best initial approach. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I think as a as a kind of a, a meta um, kind of thought to that, um, just applying empathy, like literally just put yourself in the shoes of the person receiving this issue. Like it's scary. You have someone come in from the outside world and tell you that your baby's ugly, right? If that's happening to you for the first time, like how are you going to react? It's going to be immediately defensive and that's that's human nature i actually don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing it's to me more a, a conversation about anticipating that type of reaction and trying to figure out to your question how to get it done anyway right um so i think beyond that really it comes down to whether or not you feel like they're operating in good faith you know the, some of the stuff some of the stuff that um <clears throat> sick went through in this talk around you know the initial interactions that he had to him indicated the fact that this might get brushed under the carpet. So at that, at that point, he chose to escalate, um, do more research, you know, the hacker challenge piece came into it as well, but in terms of how he's telling that story, it's gonna be your mileage may vary, I think, for the better part, which is a terrible answer, but like every bug's a snowflake, you know, every researcher is unique, every disclosure is unique, every company is unique as well. Um, so yeah, that would be my my probably main two answers to that. Like, just put yourself in their shoes before you do anything. If you're pissed off, stop and wait until you're not pissed off because this can get irritating sometimes if you're trying to get the thing across and it feels like you're shouting down a well. Um, I've done, like I've seen that and, and Bug Crowd has exposed me to thousands of people that have experienced that. That's a very predictable thing as well. So just yeah, think about, you know, all of that um, and try to get it done, try to get it fixed. Because the, the, the other downside with full disclosure is that you're exposing that information to people that might not be as well intended as you are. Um, and there's, a, there's an equities conversation that comes up at that point, right? You know, is this going to create more public impact if everyone knows about it um, than it would if it was kept private? That's a horrible, you know, this is the whole reason why things like VEP inside the government are so complicated and, and convoluted because that's a hard question to answer, right? But that's another thing to factor in. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for the talk. I really appreciated it. Um, I was just wondering, I was really interested in how John Deere's response has now obviously changed and they've got the challenge up. And Are they doing any kind of public announcement of the lessons they've learned in terms of their response to the initial approach from um, SITCODE? Only because I'm wondering if we're kind of preaching to the converted here, right? Like, how do we get, how do we communicate with companies who take the same approach that they took initially and sort of say like, oh, please don't talk to us and if you feel like you're under attack, like, are they going out to say this is a better way to do it and we should have done this sooner? And if not, how do we get them to do that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, like, to me, the, the fact that they've gone out and proactively offered a vulnerable, a vulnerable disclosure program, like that's, that is to me an admission of the fact that, yeah, this happens. Like we know we're not perfect um, and we know that sometimes things are gonna get found outside. We need to have a way to receive that. And here's the behavior that you can expect from us if you do that. Um, you know, one of the things that we did with Disclose.io was to make sure that the language in briefs like that actually created a sense of safe har harbor for the security researchers so that the uh, the recipient couldn't suddenly change their mind or cloud up and rain and all those different things. But that to me is a, an example of them actually acknowledging this and becoming proactive. Um, I believe they've done uh, like joint talks and, and different things like, like Sick and John Deere made friends eventually. Um, and I, I think there's been some stuff that they've actually done together to tell this story, you know, particularly in places like Iowa um, and, you know, areas where this is top of mind, right? Um, yeah, maybe look into that because I'm, I'm like 90% confident on that answer. But yeah, to me, going back from that, just the VDP in and of itself is a proactive measure. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, thank you for for, take, for doing the presentation, you did a great job. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know with, with John Deere, one of the reasons that, that SICK did not join their vulnerability disclosure program, and he was the first person invited into it for obvious reasons, um, was that he felt like it was really just a way for them to get him to sign an NDA that would then basically muzzle him, and he didn't yep. want to do that. And so yep. he kind of joined it and then immediately left it. Yep. Um, I guess, I'd ask you, and I should point out, <clears throat> I, you're right, I was the first person who said, hey, Deer doesn't have any CVEs, it wasn't actually my idea, I got it from, I think, Simple Nomad? I don't know, I can't remember, yeah, it was Simple. Um, but, um, so it wasn't my idea, but uh, I think I'll note, uh, John Deere still does not have any publicly disclosed CVEs on the NIST um, vulnerability database, mm -hmm. NVD and um, don't know of any plans for them to have them. So I guess the question is, um, mm. as the operator of one of the largest, you know, bug bounty platforms, um, how do we sort of thinking crawl, walk, run, right? How do we get vendors to A, <laughs> not just look at vulnerability disclosure programs as a way to muzzle researchers by getting them into NDAs, yep. B, um, kind of realize that, you know, program uh, platforms uh, like Bug Crowd, um, great way to run both private uh, bounty programs yep. and, and access that talent pool, but also that they should probably have this larger, you know, kind of wisdom of the crowd approach, right? Where, you know, the, the downside yeah. is you yeah. are going to have some public CVEs. The good side is you're going to have a lot more people looking at your For stuff. Sure. So, like, how do you kind of get them to engage in that. I'm trying to enumerate process. that question back. I, I, first things first, if it's private, it's not a VDP. Right. Full stop. Okay. Um, and I think that's a definitional, like that was a big part of the initial conversations that Sick and I were having yeah. around this. Um, you know, companies that do that um, and companies that let other companies do that, like ultimately are doing a disservice to disclosure as a baseline operating principle of the internet, right? And that's the second problem is that you know through the last 10 years of, of actually intermediating this and, and you know telling the crowdsourcing story as bug crowd like we kind of we're not definitely not the only player in the category at this point in time but we're the first to actually go out and do that um and it was really trying to solve both problems like the problem of being able to receive input from the outside world regardless of how it came in because shit happens like sometimes you need a lightning rod do you know what i mean like lightning happens yeah um it's better for it to hit the rod than to hit your house. And that's the lightning that's determining that, not you. So like that to me is the reactive thing that it just needs to be ubiquitous. 
the crowdsourcing piece, to your point, is about actually being able to engage a broader talent pool. And the problem that we have is that people confuse those concepts because um, they you get the same from both in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, I think telling like that's a marketing and education. It's a policy issue. You know, we, we've had like hard conversations inside Bug Crowd where we've had to basically deny ourselves revenue because we wouldn't do things that customers wanted us to do for this reason. Um, and I think, you know, things like that are, are ultimately what need to happen in order to establish norms and best practice and all those different things. Like Disclose I played a big role in that as well. Yep. Satisfactory answer? Yes. Yeah. Go. Cool. Uh, kind of have a two part question. Sure. So, for organizations, in your experience, for getting into an integrated vulnerability management approach where trying to build out a bug exploration or a zero day kind of a program, mm -hmm. first of all, what do you consider as like building blocks in terms of maturity that an organization need to have? Hmm. And second part of that question is, in terms of return of investment, how deep is too deep in terms of going into the rabbit hole in terms of yeah. budget and time an organization should put into considering if they're getting into this maturity at an early stage? Right. Um, so my personal and very strong point of view on this is that every organization should have a vulnerability disclosure program full stop. Um, for the reason that I just said before, it's like lightning will eventually hit your house. So put a rod up and that's something that everyone should do. Um, that's a part of the reason, uh, you know, a part of the driver behind all of the not frankly kind of bug crowd work I've done to affect policy in that direction because people need to know that. The good thing about it is that, you know, transparency actually breeds maturity um, or a perception of maturity, which is trusted in the market. So we're at a point now where companies actually are starting to want to do it because the consumer gets it. It's like neighborhood watch for the internet. I understand that, right? So there's positive things that actually drive drive that that whole movement. Um, probably the counter uh, intuitive opinion that I have is if you talk about a bug bounty program as a vulnerable disclosure program with rewards. So like the NIST 853R5 definition, I don't think most companies should do that. So if you're talking about going out to the open internet and saying, hey, we'll pay you if you can hack us and tell us what you found, the problem that that creates is there isn't enough maturity, to your point, is the inability to actually deal with that, right? Like those bugs are still there, those risks are still there, there's still a problem. But if you add another problem on top of that, then the original one's probably less likely to get solved at that point in time, right? So I think, you know, a robust downstream remediation um, process um, you know, vulnerability management, like in the true sense, inside the organization. Looking at things like, you know, ISO uh, 30, uh, three, what is it, 3011, I think. Um, there's the two ISO standards, 24197, which is intake, outside in, and there's 3011, which is what you do once you get the bug. Um, <clears throat> you do need to have both, right? Um, where I disagree with some opinions that are out there on this is that <clears throat> on the VDP side, you don't need, like, you're out of time, right? Like, if someone's found a thing, you need to have a way to receive that. So that's my kind of point of view on that. Hopefully I've answered. The second part, maybe, in terms of kind of material, what would you consider uh, not going too deep into that in terms of disclosure or in terms of research in terms of zero days? As a, as a hacker or as a recipient? As an organization. Um, sorry? So I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm actually trying to pass the question a little bit. So in terms of return on security investment, how deep is too deep in terms of time and budgets for an organization to invest in? Yeah, how deep is too deep in terms of return on investment um, with the investment an organization makes in this type of thing? You've got to be able to determine return on investment to answer that question in the first place. And I think a lot of orgs struggle with that. Um, you know, if the entire focus of a security team is just on finding bugs, then you're probably doing it wrong. Um, and there's gonna be a balancing act between defensive measures, you know, like what are you doing about like helping your engineers be better at not introducing this stuff in the future? Like there's all of these different things that go into that. So yeah, again, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string answer. Um, 
But those are the things to consider. And I think for every organization, it's going to be different because they've all got different gaps and different needs, right? Cloud native are going to find this easier because they can fix faster. A 40 year old waterfall company is going to have a hard time with this stuff. So the investment is going to be different. Hey, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, had a quick question for you. Um, so in the last like five years or so, I've seen DHS's CISA grow from uh, being a really immature organization that could barely spell vulnerability to a credible one that probably has relationships with much of the Fortune 500. Uh, so in cases where a security researcher faces an adversarial relationship with a company, they you know, they found a vulnerability and don't have a good way to, to bring it to them, uh, what are your thoughts on, and I know this is sacrilege for many hackers here, using, using government uh, to be that broker uh, to, to approach the firm initially? You can definitely do that. Um, the challenge with that is that they're pretty busy. Uh, and, and, and you've got to have, you know, I think those processes and like shout out and all power to the people that I know quite well who run them. Um, they'll probably thank me for saying this. Um, you've got to have something that's impactful in a way that will actually prioritize all of the other stuff they're getting. So if you're sending them like 50 XSS volumes in some nothing site, right, you've just basically created a load that they're not going to be able to help you with. So again, it's an equities thing. Um, you know, I do think uh, you know the, there's other ways to do that. <clears throat> um, you know, community dot disclose io as a way to basically get help from people. You know, th there was a period in time, and shout out to everyone in the room who's in this bucket, where if you weren't able to get information into the right hands, you'd tweet about it, and then someone would eventually tap me on the shoulder, and I'd find someone I knew, and it would get done that way. Um, that's basically what I just talked about. It's basically a forum that helps with that and, and kind of scales that idea out. Um, there's a lot of different things happening there, but yeah, I think, I think centralization of, of intake, it's risky. Like, I mean, you think about what we do, we've got thousands of customers, we sit, we literally do that. Um, and it's hard. It's, it's one of the reasons that what we do is, you know, people pay for it, it's because it's really difficult. So to apply that kind of solution across the entire internet, Maybe not so much. I, I, I think it needs to be distributed more than that. Josh. Hey, Josh. Hi. This is sort of for both of your personalities. Um, <laughs> get, given this is the Hungry Hungry Hackers thing, we care about food targets. Six has been one of the few that has looked at and found vulnerabilities in the food supply, not yep. just heavy equipment, but ice cream machines, you know, solar. In the healthcare space, Bo had a great idea of We Heart Hackers. So we initially started just listing all the medical device makers that had a disclosure program as a, like a wall of fame, right? Mm -hmm. Then we had a We Heart Hackers challenge from the regulator to say, will you bring your stuff to DEF CON, the Biohacky Village? Now it's in the Patch Act. It's like to, to make a new medical device come to market, you have to have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. Yep. Has any discussion between you and SICK or Paul, maybe this can lead in the next panel, like can we replicate that recipe to accelerate the number of participants from the vendor community, but also the number of participants from this community. So we target the right equipment that has the highest impact and maybe short circuit what was a nine year journey until maybe like yeah, a couple and of establish years. sane baselines from a hygiene standpoint, all that kind of stuff as well. There's some private events and like CornCon has some of these things, but is there a discussion about like getting it. to critical mass? Yeah, so so we've, uh, he and I have definitely talked about that. He's he's a hardware guy um, and and, you know, these kind of domains tend to have a lot of hardware in them. So it's a topic of conversation that we have a lot. Um, I think one of the areas uh, that validates what you're talking about, um, we got pulled into election security um, in a pretty heavy way in, in 2018. Um, and that's a five year cycle, ultimately, in terms of some of the stuff that's popping out. It followed the exact same story out, right? Um, and I think, you know, lather, rinse, repeat, like the more, the more scalable, like the more repeatable this journey of like, ah, what the hell are you talking about? Like, are you, you know, trying to tank my company through to doing the right thing and the best thing? Um, and then the more, you know, that can be made appealing to organizations, I think the better. And at the same time, actually regulating it and having stick is, is pretty important too. Okay, we've got one last question before we're gonna wrap up six presentation because we we have to assemble i'll, I'll oh, go i'll go put a suit and tie on a and come back wonderful to a wonderful <laughs> panel presentation you're not going to want to miss so here is our last question sorry to come back around but uh, got, I, I was just googling something and i thought this was pretty interesting 
John Deere having no CVEs is 84th on the Fortune 500 list. So thinking more about what you just said about how we take something repeatable, yeah. how many other Fortune 500 companies have zero CVEs? Yep. And I think that's an interesting thought for everyone here to kind of go home with and see what you can make happen from that. Yeah, I mean, to me, it goes back to some of the stuff we we're talking about over here before around like transparency is ultimately anti-fragile. So like you put the computer science hat on and think about it at a system thinking level, that's just true. So the closer you can get to that, the more resilient you're going to be, but it converts to consumer trust as well at this point in time uh, is starting to. And I think for us, like helping, you know, the marketers in the room or the, the folks that, that straddle this kind of work and communication or policy, helping people tell that story and actually getting more interest in, in seeing organizations do this well, I think that creates a virtuous loop that we're at the beginnings of, but I think that could be a lot more effective as a way we get solved. Okay, please join me in thanking Casey and Sick for a fabulous joint presentation. Thank you.